Okay, let us discuss integrating out versus matching two different though very similar uh, methods to construct an EFT if you have available a fundamental theory and you want to obtain its low energy limit. We already discussed both, um, but let me just summarize uh, the main uh, ways to think about according to the two uh, methods, which as I said, are very similar and uh, related. So we want to start with a full theory and go to low energies. As a result, we have seen that any full theory reduces to some effective field theory given by potentially non-renormalizable Lagrangians. And uh, the question is, how can we obtain the correct effective field theory in practice? And uh, as the title suggests, there are two ways to do it, which mainly differ in uh, not so much in the technical details, but uh, maybe in the way to think about, and also in the way how generally applicable they are. Let us discuss both briefly, just write down the main principles, starting with integrating out. So by integrating out, I mean a procedure which really starts with the details of the fundamental theory and in a direct way constructs the ingredients of the EFT. And we have seen how that can work, for example, in the path integral. And the second way was using the method of regions or large mass expansion, which is for our purposes the same thing. Um, so in both cases, we can directly construct the EFT. Um, that means in detail, we construct the EFT Lagrangian from diagrams in the full theory. Okay, diagrams or more generally from the path integral. So just to recap, you can take the path integral of the full theory, which is an integral over all field configurations of heavy and light modes. Then you directly integrate over the heavy modes, including modes of light fields, but with heavy momenta. And uh, as an outcome, you obtain a path integral just over the light modes, and that is your EFT. So it's a very direct principle, maybe not easy to apply in practice, but the principle is very easy to understand. Similarly, using method of regions or large mass expansion, you take any diagram of the full theory, and in particular, uh, the large mass expansion algorithm directly produces Feynman rules, vertices, and Feynman diagrams of the EFT. So uh, therefore, you have a constructive recipe to construct the Lagrangian of the EFT. And of course, both of this also uh, provides the proof that the EFT exists in the first place. And um, even if you do not know how the EFT will, should look like a priori, the outcome will automatically be the correct EFT. So just as an illustration, uh, I wanted to write down some one-loop diagrams. For example, we have looked at the photon self-energy in the exercise with a heavy particle in the loop, like for example the muon, and uh, we consider the muon to be heavy compared to the light electron and the photon at low energies. Then using the method of regions, this gives us that uh, the result can be Taylor expanded in the external momentum of the photon. And the uh, there is no second term because uh, th this is the only subdiagram which appears in the large mass expansion. And the result of the Taylor expansion is directly a local vertex 
for an effective field theory. So here you have constructed directly an EFT Feynman rule. Similarly, we can start from this sort of diagram that we also considered a few times, for example, in the context of G minus two with an attached photon, but in general, if we have a light particle self energy and a heavy particle in the loop, but only one heavy particle in the loop, then the method of regents gives us two terms. On the one hand, we obtain uh, from the soft integration region in the loop, we obtain just the Taylor expansion of the heavy line, which gives us an effective vertex to which four light lines can couple, and this effective vertex is inserted into the light Feynman diagram, and then we obtain this sort of Feynman diagram with a quartic vertex with four light lines. But here, this is only one out of two terms in the method of regions, and the second term comes from the large momentum region in the loop, and there we get directly the Taylor expansion of the full loop diagram, uh, which provides an effective bilinear Feynman rule. So here in this way, uh, the construction provides you with two EFT Feynman rules, namely on the one hand, this uh, two-point Feynman rule coming from the one-loop Taylor expansion, and this four-point Feynman rule coming from the three-level Taylor expansion. Okay, but in all cases, and uh, also at the two-loop level and higher, you can uh, use this principle to construct uh, the EFT. So this is a very detailed approach which automatically works. Now, let us compare with this the point of view of matching. So in the matching point of view, you start from the knowledge that the EFT exists, and that knowledge comes from this way of looking at it. But once we know that the EFT exists, we can use it right from the beginning. So we use the knowledge that the EFT exists and has a particular form. So which form does it have? Depends on the case we are looking at. But whenever you start with some fundamental theory and take the low energy limit, you will know that the EFT contains a particular set of field operators, a particular um, principle of power counting applies, and then you know the structure of the EFT Lagrangian. So certain light fields plus power counting rules. Okay, and uh, if we use this knowledge, we can write down an ansatz. That is the main new point. We do an ansatz for the most general form of the EFT Lagrangian and afterwards match it to the fundamental theory. That is the point. So the ansatz means that we write down an EFT ansatz, which is some appropriate Lagrangian with terms of dimension four or less, plus higher dimensional operators, CI, OI divided by M to the power NI. So this is just a generic way of writing down an EFT Lagrangian. And uh, the notation implies that here there are operators of dimension five or more. So all of these terms are suppressed by some um, non-vanishing powers of the heavy masses. And here there are dimensionless coefficients, and here these are operators constructed out of the light fields and their derivatives. And which operators appear and how they are suppressed uh, is the a priori knowledge from this power counting. So once you have this ansatz, 
the only unknowns are the values of these coefficients. And they are then determined by matching, and matching simply means you require that the physics described by this Lagrangian is the same as the one of the fundamental theory. So let us just write this down. You do a matching calculation and require the following. So some uh, green functions with only light fields and small momenta. Um, should become equal to the corresponding green functions in the full theory. Now, what is exactly the correspondence? In the full theory, we should take here Feynman diagrams which are one light particle irreducible according to our path integral derivation and also according to the large mass expansion. So these are one light particle irreducible diagrams in the full theory, and they can become equal to the one particle irreducible diagrams in the EFT. So in the EFT, there are only light particles, therefore here, one light particle irreducible is the same as one particle irreducible, but uh, this is the correspondence that we can achieve, and that it is possible to achieve it, um, we have seen from the large mass expansion. Okay, and uh, so this equality is of course not exact, but it is an equality in the sense of a Taylor expansion. We can do these Taylor expansions to any order that we want, and at the order that we are working, we can obtain this equality, but then higher order terms will be different, higher order terms in the light masses and the small momenta up to desired order corresponding to the power counting that uh, you have required uh, in the a priori ansatz. Now, this is the most detailed equality that you can possibly achieve between an EFT and the full theory. Sometimes, however, you are interested in less, and you do not want this most detailed agreement between the full theory and the EFT, and we have already seen examples of that. Do you know uh, what else we could require? A weaker equality, a weaker condition, where we do not require the equality between one light particle irreducible green functions. What else could become <coughs> equal between the full theory and the EFT? As matrix elements. Yes, indeed, exactly. And that is a weaker requirement because as matrix elements. Uh, are obtained from a combination of these green functions and S matrix elements, for example, are independent of the field parametrization, also independent of the way we normalize our fields. Um, all of these uh, unphysical properties of green functions drop out in the calculation of physical S matrix elements, and we might uh, simply be happy with knowing that the physical S matrix elements are equal. And uh, then our EFT um, matching calculation will most likely be simpler. And the EFT Lagrangian could also be simpler. So we could require equality of S matrix elements and uh, write down the simplest possible Lagrangian which does the job. So therefore, let us write this down as well or only require physical S matrix. Of course, again, only with light fields and small momenta in the full theory becomes equal to the physical S matrix in the EFT. Again, only for light fields and small momenta and only up to the desired order. Um, but uh, here, in this weaker requirement, we can use, for example, this redundancy that we have discussed 
use field tree definitions in the EFT Lagrangian to simplify the Lagrangian because such field tree definitions do not change the S matrix. So here we can immediately use field redefinitions, etc., to simplify the Lagrangian of the EFT. And actually, this uh, can also give you some uh, even more general idea. Namely, does it have to be uh, that the EFT contains the same field operators as the fundamental theory? So far, this was always automatic. We have, for example, in the path integral integrated out heavy fields and uh, didn't integrate out the light fields. So the light fields of the full theory are automatically uh, fields which exist in the EFT. But does it have to be the case? No, it doesn't. Because if we require just the equality of S matrix elements, we could write down any field operator in the EFT, which just gives the same S matrix. And uh, I mean, we have already seen field redefinitions are possible. Therefore, if we redefine our field in a complicated way, the S matrix will not change. And so in general, that shows us that an EFT can be constructed, which just contains some fields, which, however, describe the same physics as the light fields in the fundamental theory. And there doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between field operators in the EFT and uh, the light fields or some subset of fields in the full theory. Just to avoid confusion, uh, so that you know, there doesn't have to be such a correspondence, even though very often there is such a correspondence. But it's not a criterion or a necessary condition on EFTs. And we will come back to this, such that you will also see some other examples which um, blow your mind or uh, whatever. Good. OK, so then uh, next section, conclusions on EFT, general conclusions. The first conclusion that I want to draw is uh, on EFT without fundamental theories. So, and uh, before I do that, let me clean the blackboard. Any questions to the previous discussion? Yep. So there it means one light particle irreducible uh, because that is uh, the condition of the expansion uh, of the large mass expansion. So we can equate one light particle irreducible diagrams. And in the EFT, there is no difference between one particle and one light particle irreducible. Let us uh, use our knowledge and uh, maybe let us start with some fundamental theory number one. Let us compare it to some fundamental theory two, some fundamental theory three, theory four, and so on. And for each of these different fundamental theories, we can take the low energy limit. For example, this might be QED with the muon, as we have seen in the exercise. QED with the muon and the tau lepton, and maybe even with uh, quarks. This could be the standard model, that the supersymmetric standard model or the standard model extended with some additional Higgs bosons. So, uh, or some grand unified theory, and so on. So we have different uh, starting points, different fundamental theories. And uh, let us look at the low energy limit. So for example, here in these two QED versions, we might look at the low energy limit appropriate for chemistry, 
such that we work at very, very low energies where we can only excite photons and electrons and the muons and taus are irrelevant. Then the low energy limit of these two theories will in both cases be QED, just uh, ordinary QED with photons and electrons but without muons uh, and also without taus. Therefore the low energy EFT here is the same. So in both of these cases we will get some EFT, let's call it EFT1. Similarly, if you take the standard model um, or the standard model plus heavy supersymmetric particles or some grand unified theory and you work at uh, energies below whatever, below the Higgs mass, below the W mass, then uh, all of these heavy supersymmetric particles or heavy current unification particles, they can all be integrated out. The uh, effective theory will be an effective theory which just contains the light fields, which are all the standard model fields, and the symmetries uh, restrict the EFT, and the symmetries are the standard model symmetries, and therefore the EFT in both cases would be the standard model. And so it's the same EFT again. Maybe there will be many theories which give rise to some EFT2. So you see here certain universality classes if you want. Different fundamental theories can give rise to the same EFT in the low energy limit. The same in the sense that uh, they have the same structure of the Lagrangian and the same symmetries but not the same in another sense, namely what could be, in your opinion, the only difference between uh, the outcomes between the low energy limits of these different fundamental theories. Yeah. Basically, any constant Yes, exactly, so the values of the constants. So the structure, which operators are there, uh, that is the same, but the numerical values or uh, the formulas for the prediction of these constants, they might be different. And we have seen it explicitly for the charge in QED. There was a finite correction to the charge coming from integrating out the muon. If you also integrate out the tau, uh, the finite uh, correction will be twice as large. Um, but the structure is the same and the values are different. So we get universality classes. Several fundamental theories can lead to the same EFT. And uh, just to write this down, maybe different numerical values of these coefficients that we always call CI. So which details of the fundamental theory then matter? In other words, which properties of the fundamental theory determine in which universality class we are? Do we get this EFT, which was maybe a QED, or do we get that EFT, which is maybe the standard model, including all the standard model fields? Uh, how do we know uh, which EFT we end up with, or if we do this matching ansatz, uh, how do we know which ansatz we should take? And so. That is what we should now list. So any ideas how uh, you can figure out whether your EFT leads to QED with photons and electrons or to a theory like the standard model with photons, electrons, W, Z, and the Higgs? Exactly, so we first need to know which are the light fields. Uh, or also which are the light particles, which should be described by light field operators. So you must know uh, which light 
particles your fundamental theory predicts and they must be part of the EFT. And light means, of course, light. You have to define, first of all, what means light and heavy for you and then you figure out what is the set of light particles. Then, another property is these power counting rules. What is exactly the ratio of quantities that you consider small? And uh, what is the Taylor expansion? Uh, in which variable do you expand and to what order do we go? And so this uh, can be just summarized by saying which are the power counting rules. This is often fairly obvious and so that was not a deep discussion so far, but in some theories it is actually a little bit tricky. And the final thing, we already alluded to it as well, is uh, which set of operators can actually appear in the um, EFT. Um, and uh, that depends on the symmetries of the EFT. And so you should, um, in the best uh, case, be aware of the low energy symmetry of your fundamental theory. That is maybe not always totally obvious to see, but uh, if you see it, then uh, that is a, a really important um, let's say condition on your EFT which narrows down where you are. If of course if you forget some symmetry then you would simply uh, omit it and your Lagrangian ansatz contains more terms and then you will be maybe surprised that some terms turn out to be zero. But if you know about the symmetry then you can omit those terms from the beginning. So which OI appear and that is uh, typically equivalent to saying which symmetries are present in the EFT. Okay, so this is basically the set of uh, the details that matter in order to obtain the structure of the EFT and then uh, once you have the structure then other details determine the numerical values of all the coefficients. And then you get, of course, different instances of one EFT or of another EFT. So, and now we can turn the whole thing around. You know that many, many different fundamental theories will give rise to one EFT or to another EFT, and that uh, means that you can simply consider the EFT and forget about where it came from looking at just one such EFT with a certain set of light fields and light symmetries um, is a substitute for discussing all possible fundamental theories which would lead to this particular EFT. And so you can uh, get rid of uh, the need to know what fundamental theory you are working with and simply look at the EFT and take it seriously. So let us write down this kind of point of view. So if the fundamental theory is unknown. You can simply start from some assumptions. Namely, exactly these kind of assumptions. You assume uh, you have some fundamental theory which might be unknown, but which contains a certain set of light particles, possibly the particles you have observed in experiment, um, uh, which are the power counting rules and which are the symmetries. So, namely, the assumptions are set of light particles or states or fields. The symmetries and power counting rules. Then you do an ansatz of the most general EFT compatible with this. And then this EFT that you um, construct in this way is automatically correct for all 
possible fundamental theories with these properties. this kind. And uh, so low energy observables can be fully computed in the EFT. You do not need to know the fundamental theory in order to do meaningful physics um, for low energies. Now when this um, kind of point of view can be applied in several different directions. One important direction is really uh, the applicational one. Namely, if you are actually interested in computing something that you want to compare with experiment or you want to give the result of some physical quantity to somebody because you are genuinely interested in the outcome of some calculation, then uh, you can free yourself from uh, the need to start from a fundamental theory and do the calculation in the EFT. You know it is definitely correct and probably easier than a calculation in the fundamental theory. And then uh, you have here a very important tool. And that is obviously applied in, in practice. And you always apply it, um, maybe without knowing it. Uh, if anybody does a calculation in ordinary quantum mechanics, uh, for atomic physics or molecular physics or solid state physics or even if you do some higher energy particle physics calculation just using QED then you use that because QED is of course a low energy EFT for the standard model and there is no point in doing any atomic physics calculation in the standard model it would be uselessly complicated QED is the correct EFT and the calculation is simpler and therefore you do it in QED. Unless of course you are maybe interested in the precise value of the impact of the Higgs boson onto the hydrogen levels. Okay, if you want to know that, then maybe for this particular purpose you would go to the standard model and do the calculation there. But otherwise, uh, you do not need to know this. And actually, uh, seriously, if you really want to know what is the impact of the Higgs on hydrogen spectra, then the way to do it would be for sure to take the standard model and derive, in fact, QED as a low energy EFT for the standard model. But in this case, plus higher dimensional operators in the way we saw it. So QED will be extended by dimension five, six, seven, eight operators with coefficients which are predicted from the matching calculation. And then from this matching calculation, you have precise values for all these higher dimensional coefficients. And those values um, describe the impact of the Higgs on low energy physics. And then you do atomic physics from a Hamiltonian derived in this way using additional terms, uh, additional in comparison to the usual um, hydrogen um, Hamiltonian, okay, and then you know uh, and have a simple way to calculate the impact of all the heavy standard model particles onto a spectra. That is the way it is done. So this is one way of looking at it as a calculational tool which is really efficient. And the second way is um, the opposite and that is often done in current LHC physics or current particle physics where we are actually really interested in knowing the true fundamental theory beyond the standard model. We uh, have reasons to suspect that the standard model is not the ultimate truth. It's not the most fundamental theory of nature. There is probably something beyond it, maybe grand unification, maybe supersymmetry, but we don't know. And uh, the standard model is most likely a correct effective field theory, a low energy effective field theory of something unknown, something fundamental. But then, of course, uh, in this case, we are not happy by just using the standard model as a calculational tool. We want to know what the fundamental theory is. And so uh, we can then extend the standard model by higher dimensional operators. 
and hopefully measure the values of the coefficients of these higher dimensional operators. And once we know such values, we could compare the measurements of these higher dimensional coefficients to distinct predictions of different fundamental theories, um, which would, as we discussed, give different values for the coefficients. So, and then the EFT point of view gives you insights which coefficients are maybe particularly strongly dependent on details of the fundamental theory. If you figure out some coefficients which are really uh, give different values for different fundamental theories, then these are the coefficients which you should measure first. Um, so, for example, in the other lecture in the last semester, I told you that uh, g minus 2 is such a coefficient. g minus 2 is the magnetic moment corresponding to the spin. This corresponds to an effective field theory operator whose value is uh, really determined from the details of the fundamental theory. Once you know or measure g minus 2 precisely enough, you um, know some details of the fundamental theory. However, um, the magnetic moment associated not with the spin but with the orbital angular momentum, the g factor corresponding to L instead of corresponding to S, that is not determined by the details of the fundamental theory, it is always the same. And um, so the EFT um, logic shows you that, and uh, then of course you shouldn't really do an experiment measuring g for the orbital angular momentum, but you should only measure g corresponding to the spin. So these are things you can learn from looking at the EFT. And um, uh, in this way, uh, you have now some insight into EFT without fundamental theory. Okay, um, next point. A generalization of this one. Uh, Non-perturbative logic. So basically, I summarize here Weinberg's point of view, which he expresses in his quantum field theory book, volume one, which is uh, basically leading to effective field theories being always correct, no matter uh, what the fundamental theory is. So he starts from assuming the existence of uh, certain particles, elementary particles, or um, not, sorry, uh, not elementary particles, but particles in the sense of relativistic quantum mechanics, a set of one particle states. And in relativistic quantum mechanics, one particle states uh, correspond to irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. So that sounds technical, but that is really the proper definition of particles. And this definition applies to, for example, electrons, where actually there are some, uh, doesn't even fully apply, but anyway, uh, electrons, photons, but it also applies to protons, for example, they are not elementary, but nevertheless, they are from irreducible representations of the Poincaré group, nuclei even, or even atoms. For example, the hydrogen atom in the ground state forms an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group, so it classifies also as a one particle state, even though it is not elementary. So that distinction is not important but we assume a set of one particle states and we assume relativity expressed in terms of Poincaré invariance plus the rules of quantum mechanics and uh, the point is then um, relativity plus quantum mechanics plus locality in the sense of uh, what he calls cluster decomposition principle.
which basically simply means that the experiments on the Earth and on the Moon are independent. So if you have an S matrix for the combination of a process taking place here and somewhere else, uh, the S matrices factorize into a product of two S matrices which are independent. That is this cluster decomposition. And uh, under the combination of these three um, items, uh, the most general S matrix or the most general Hamiltonian for interactions of these one particle states is given by a local relativistic quantum field theory. which can be defined by giving a Lagrangian, which can be split into a free Lagrangian and an interaction Lagrangian. And then in this setup, the free Lagrangian describes exactly the one particle states that you started with. So this contains fields for the one particle states. And this describes interactions, obviously, between uh, these one particle states. So, and if you see it, then this way of looking at it does not give you necessarily the absolutely fundamental theory of nature, like string theory or a grand unified theory or the standard model even. But what it rather gives you is an effective field theory which describes consistently interactions between any kind of one particle states that you want to have, including non-elementary uh, bound states like the proton nuclei and so on. So, that is the way of looking at it by Weinberg. So the result is then the following. If you apply this to particles of mass smaller than some uh, capital mass M, if you apply it to some quantum field theory, you know, then uh, independently of what the fundamental theory is, um, if you want to describe only the particles, including non-elementary ones, but um, maybe or, or only elementary ones, depending on what you want, only light particles, then automatically there exists a quantum field theory according to the statement which describes precisely your chosen set of light particles and their interactions. And this theory is a relativistic quantum field theory. So this logic implies the existence of an EFT just for these light particles. So, and uh, that can even be applied if two bound states. And here let me just give you the most important and most well-known, maybe most obvious example and definitely the example which was historically the basis of this point of view namely uh, low energy QCD, more precisely low energy hadron physics, because the hadrons were known, strongly interacting particles were known before QCD existed, and people were trying very hard to understand the dynamics of these strongly interacting particles, and one way to do it is using this EFT approach. So that is the most important example of this way of looking at it, let's say QCD, but at energies below 
for example, half a tree EV. If you look at uh, strongly interacting particles, but below half a GeV, then which strongly interacting uh, uh, particles are there? The proton is too heavy, but uh, some other particles exist with masses uh, in that energy region. Does anybody know some particles? No. Pions. Anything else? Kaons, yes, they are also light. And so on, but these two are the most uh, well-known ones, and there are already many of them, charged and neutral and so on, anti kaons And uh, so, so the statement is there exists an EFT, uh, which describes exactly these particles, and this EFT would contain fundamental field operators for those bound states. So with fundamental meson fields. Okay, so fundamental in the sense of the EFT. So from the EFT point of view, you do not see that the mesons are bound states. The mesons are treated as elementary particles and each meson is described by one field operator like a scalar field operator, for example, for the pions and kaons, the meson fields. And uh, the free Lagrangian contains simply a kinetic terms uh, for these meson fields. And the interaction Lagrangian contains interactions between the mesons. And you could even think of interactions between the mesons and photons. Photons are obviously also light or even electrons. And so you could extend your EFT to include the photon as well. Plus photons and maybe E plus E minus. And the statement following from this uh, very general point of view proposed by Steven Weinberg is that this EFT must exist and it must be possible to write it down in a way which correctly describes the low energy dynamics of the mesons. This theory is very well known and it has a name, chiral perturbation theory. And so historically, this is certainly one of the most or maybe the most important effective field theory which um, is paradigmatic for the development of EFT and so the entire way of looking at EFTs uh, follows from the analysis of this chiral perturbation theory. And we will most likely also come back to it and look at some more details of this theory. But uh, this is what I mentioned before, just so you know, there does not have to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the fields in the fundamental theory and the fields in the EFT and you see here the um, set of fields in the EFT is totally different from the fields in the fundamental QCD. Here in this EFT there are no quarks, no gluons, only meson fields. So completely different, nevertheless the EFT exists and correctly describes the fundamental dynamics of the full theory. Very nice. If you do not have questions, we will then change the topics and start with renormalization group. Good. Let me uh, nevertheless clean the blackboard. What is your question? Or Hamiltonian in that sense, or why do 
Um, I don't know why I said most likely uh, when I said it, but uh, one um, correct thing is that uh, it is of course not guaranteed that there are no other light particles in nature beyond the ones in the standard model. It could, for example, be that there are some additional very light Higgs bosons which um, are not contained in the standard model and if they are light and if they exist, then of course they should be included in an EFT for light physics. But we have not seen them yet and so therefore if they exist, their interactions must be somehow weak. Um, but that would be an example where the truly correct EFT at uh, energies below the weak scale would be different from the standard model. Let us come to the renormalization group. Uh, maybe you remember that the entire lecture is called Effective Field Theory and the Renormalization Group. So now we will come to this second part of the lecture title, namely Renormalization Group. And in order to motivate it and to relate it to the previous discussion, in the EFTs we have now um, become able to discuss and analyze the low energy limit of some fundamental theory. So we work in an energy regime below the mass scale of some heavy particles. Like in the standard model, we have heavy W, Z bosons and the Higgs, and we would look at the physics described by these particles at much lower energies. And uh, the EFT provides us a technical tool for that purpose. The renormalization group, in the way we will discuss it, does exactly the opposite. Namely, if you want to learn what is going on at heavy energies at, or at high energies, higher than the mass scales of the particles in your theory, then the renormalization group is the appropriate tool for that. And therefore, effective field theory and renormalization group complement each other and you really need the combination of the two to analyze the full energy dependence in some uh, fundamental theory. So uh, from this point of view, it should be obvious that it is motivated to discuss the renormalization group, but also um, uh, the combination can be motivated uh, very well. So you see, in the fundamental theory, you have heavy particles and light particles, and uh, so if you are in between the heavy and the light scales, you um, have always, let's say, two um, big ratios in your physical problem. You have the ratio of your energy scale to the heavy masses and the ratio to the light masses. And uh, both, you cannot arrange that uh, both ratios become small at the same time. So, but if you integrate out the heavy particles, then you are left with only one ratio. And uh, that is um, the, the improvement coming from the EFT. But then you, in the EFT, suddenly your energy scale that you can consider is maybe higher than all the other fundamental mass scales in the EFT. And therefore, once you want to have calculational control in the EFT, uh, you work suddenly at high energies instead of low energies and therefore uh, after integrating out the heavy particles you would uh, be able to use the renormalization group to further improve the precision in the EFT. So the logic of the combination of the two tools would be you want to have very precise control over some observable in a fundamental theory which has particles at all energy scales. You integrate out the heavy particles then you use the renormalization group and uh, in the combination you have full control about everything. Okay, so that is the idea and that is why the renormalization group is not only complementary but adds to the power of EFTs. Now hopefully we can write. So this is section five, the renormalization group. The physics motivation I have just given to you, but a technical question that you can ask is what is the role of the regularization scale mu in dimensional regularization actually? 
It appears, but it is clearly unphysical, at least we think it is, um, but how can we actually prove that it is unphysical? We will be able to prove it using the renormalization group. Then, of course, everybody has heard about the term running coupling constants. What are running couplings? They are the couplings which run according to the renormalization group. So we will learn about uh, this term, what it means and where it comes from and how it is related to the renormalization group. And more physically speaking, what is the physical energy dependence of any theory that we are actually interested in? So, and as I said, the renormalization group is particularly powerful if you work at energies which are much bigger than the fundamental mass in your theory. And in this sense, it is complementary. And in most of the important applications of EFTs, you actually use both. You use EFT, and in the EFT, you use renormalization group techniques. So in the following, we will discuss the renormalization group in general. And at first, we will not combine it with EFTs, but I will just give you a crash course on renormalization group for let's say, renormalizable quantum field theories like QED or phi to the 4 theory. And later on, we will then add to it these non-renormalizable operators with Wilson coefficients and with, with mass suppressions. But the main points um, will, first of all, be discussed in the context of uh, mainly the phi to the 4 theory, just to have a concrete case. And in this um, examples, we will also always work in dimensional regularization. And we will mostly use the minimal subtraction renormalization scheme, the MS bar scheme, where the counterterms correspond to strict one over epsilon poles and where the counterterms do not have additional finite contributions. There are other definitions of the renormalization group, which we will not discuss, at least not at the moment. Okay, so let us begin with the derivation of the renormalization group equation. And as the very first item in this derivation, we will immediately introduce running couplings. Okay, so let us begin with a technical definition of a quantum field theory. Technically, at least in perturbation theory, the quantum field theory is defined in terms of the Feynman diagrams. And the Feynman diagrams um, are defined in dimensional regularization, so in d equal 4 minus 2 epsilon. So um, where do the Feynman diagrams come from? They come from the Lagrangian, because the Lagrangian determines the Feynman rules. And uh, from the Lagrangian, we obtain the Feynman diagrams by either going through the path integral derivation of Feynman rules or using canonical operator quantization. Uh, which ultimately leads to the so-called Gelman law formula. But whatever we do, this Gelman law formula, uh, is, there is an equivalent form in the path integral and using operators. And this then really gives us the technical definition of the Feynman diagrams. So let's write this down, path integral or Gelman law formula. This uh, provides us with the Feynman rules, but uh, the gelman yaw for formula must be applied to an action, or a Lagrangian, but more precisely, to an action in the quantum field theory. And since we already take into account regularization and renormalization altogether, uh, 
the two full Feynman diagrams come from the bare action, which is the one which includes the counter terms. So ultimately, the full quantum field theory is really defined by the bare action, which I call S bare. And uh, this action in D dimensions is given by mu to the power D minus four times D dimensional integral over X of a bare Lagrangian. And the bare Lagrangian can then be split into a renormalized Lagrangian or a classical Lagrangian plus counterterm Lagrangian as we discussed before, but um, we do not write that down right now. This is the main point which defines all the Feynman diagrams in the theory. And now let us go to phi to the four theory, just to be able to write, write it down concretely. Uh, the choice of the theory doesn't really matter, but uh, I want to write down concrete formulas and uh, you can generalize yourself. So for example, the analysis that we will do now should be repeated and the first exercise for QED. So you can do exactly literally all the steps we do now for QED as well. So the bare action in phi to the four theory is one half times the derivative of the bare field squared minus bare mass squared divided by two times the bare field squared minus bare coupling g bare divided by four factorial times the bare field to the fourth power. This is the bare Lagrangian for phi to the four theory. And then the bare quantities are defined as follows. So the bare field is given by a square root of capital Z times the renormalized field. Uh, the bare mass square is given by the renormalized mass square plus delta M square. And the bare coupling is given by the renormalized coupling plus delta G. And then these are called renormalized quantities. These are the so-called renormalization constants, which, for example, absorb divergences. And in the MS bar scheme, those renormalization constants are purely given by one over epsilon poles. And in other schemes, they might also contain finite parts. And we already discussed that the physics of the theory depends only on the values of the bare quantities and not on how you split them into renormalized plus renormalization constant. Because ultimately all the diagrams just depend on the bare Lagrangian. Okay, so now the next important point is, and maybe I will do that here, we can now massage the bare Lagrangian a little bit and uh, do something with the regularization scale mu which appears in dimensional regularization. Let's first um, make sure that you all agree that I can write down um, mu to the d minus four here at this place. Probably we didn't do it before, but the way the mu has appeared so far was always that each loop integral in d dimensions is multiplied with mu to the four minus d, the opposite factor. And uh, now I write it into the action. And the point is, if I write it into the action like this, then it is an automatic consequence of just deriving the Feynman rules in the normal way that each momentum space loop integral is accompanied by the factor mu to the four minus d. So therefore, if I say, that the standard derivation of Gelman law formula and Feynman rules and so on uh, follows from this action, then this action will, among other things, automatically also produce the mu to the four minus d in front of every loop integral. That is the point. And so that is why this statement is literally correct, including d dimensional loop integrations and including the mu to the four minus d in front of the loop integrations. But now this mu appears in this place and uh, we see here uh, that the Lagrangian depends only on the bare quantities and I told you that physics depends only on the bare quantities and if you remember correctly when I said it at the time, I also said 
um, if we leave the regularization scheme unchanged while we do something to the renormalization scheme. So the regularization scheme is expressed in terms of the mu. So you would now see the full theory and the full diagrams depend on the bare Lagrangian, but obviously also the value of mu somehow matters. And now the question is, is mu uh, some physical quantity which influences physical results or physical calculations, or does it drop out of physical results? And of course, you hope that mu drops out. But how can we make that explicit? And the point is we can make explicit that mu is unphysical by absorbing mu into the bare action. So we will now do that. Absorb mu by defining something which I call an even more bare action than this bare action um, in the following way. So we can write the following. S bare is just a d-dimensional integral over x of some quantity. And now let us write down here an even more bare Lagrangian where the mu doesn't appear anymore. So we absorb the mu. How can we absorb the mu? The first term uh, from here is mu to the 4 minus d times the derivative of phi bare squared. So we can absorb the mu by redefining our bare field into a slightly modified bare field. Let's call it phi capital B because it's even more bare than before. And this capital B is defined as the previous bare field times some mu dependence, and what I want to achieve is that we get here one half d mu of just the very bare field squared, okay? So we want that mu to the d minus four times this is equal to that. What is the necessary relation between the previous bare field and the new even more bare field? In order to achieve it. Two minus d half, yes. Um, mu, is it not the opposite? Mu to the d ah, yes, minus four over two. Yeah. If we write it like this. Then this is an equality, okay? And so we have absorbed the mu into a redefined field operator. Then our second term here was um, mass square, so let's define an even more bare mass term, and uh, such that the second term looks like this. So previously we had mu to the d minus four times phi bare square times the bare mass square. Now we want that the term becomes this one. In order to achieve it, what must be the definition of this even more bare mass? The same as the before term now? It's the same. Right, and uh, because the phi square absorbs the same mu coefficient as here, and so therefore the mass is unchanged. Nevertheless, I introduce a new symbol just to make it more transparent what happens. Okay, and now the final term. Let's say we want that the final term looks like this, g very bare times the very bare field to the fourth power. Previously, we had mu to the d minus four times g bare and phi bare to the fourth. Um, now, is the g bare also unchanged, or is there some change between the previous coupling and the modified even more bare coupling constant? Yes. mu to the four minus d. Because then uh, here we have two additional powers of the phi bare and uh, these two additional powers bring in mu to the d minus four and that is compensated in this way. And so 
that is your task to do exactly the same for QED, okay, where we have the photon field and the electron field and a mass term for the electron and a gauge coupling between the two. Go through the same procedure and then you will find an even more bare electron and photon field mass term and gauge coupling. And uh, you will get similar factors, but not the same ones. They differ slightly. So, but now we have absorbed the mu in terms of these new quantities. And so now we discover that our full theory is described by this bare action, which is, however, the same as that bare action. And uh, this bare action depends on one field operator, one mass term, and one coupling constant. And so we can clearly conclude that physical results can only depend on these three quantities. Actually, the field operator is not physical as well, so the physical results can only depend on these two quantities and on nothing else. That is the conclusion. And so we see that the theory has two physical parameters, namely a mass and a coupling parameter, and there is not a third physical quantity, mu, which would independently influence physical results because it can be absorbed. So that is the outcome of this analysis. It's a very important analysis. So since it is important, let us write it down here into this box. So the full theory, or in other words, all physical results and also green functions of the form where we have really these very bare field operators in the expectation value, they can only depend on these two parameters. That is an important outcome. And by the way, previously we discussed renormalization schemes at one point, where we said that if the regularization is unchanged, which means mu is unchanged, then it doesn't matter how we split um, these bare quantities into renormalized plus renormalization constants. That is included in this statement, but this statement is more general because we can simultaneously even change mu and uh, change basically, for example, here we change mu and change the bare quantity and maybe also change the split into renormalized plus renormalization constant. But as long as the combination of everything stays the same, physics is unchanged. So let me write this down as well. So this includes the statement that was in section 2, 3, 3 on changing renormalization schemes. All right, so this is a very important outcome. Mu is unphysical and it can be absorbed in this way into a very bare action with capital B subscripts. And now let us work out what that means in terms of the so-called famous running coupling constants. Because they are now exactly the couplings which uh, depend on mu in such a way that these combinations remain constant. So you see running couplings are mu dependent couplings which do not change uh, the physics if we change mu. That is the point. So let's make this explicit. running couplings and similar quantities. We will see what that is. So let G of mu 
and m square of mu be such that the following holds, namely the bare quantities remain constant, so d by d mu of g capital bare is zero. Okay. So that means exactly what I said before. G bare is a combination of mu, the renormalized coupling, and the renormalization constant. And the whole thing should be mu independent if we put in this mu dependent coupling constant. So let's make it more explicit. D by D mu of mu to maybe let's make it explicit. This is mu to the minus epsilon. Uh, is it? Ah, uh, here, okay, I was looking at the wrong thing. Two epsilon times G of mu plus delta G. And what is delta G actually? Delta G is of course a renormalization constant which is calculated at one loop order, two loop order and so on. It's a perturbative expression. So it is a power series in the renormalized coupling. So let's maybe write this here like this. This is a power series in G of mu. So therefore, you have here G of mu explicit. Here, G of mu appears with some higher powers and with one loop coefficients and so on. And here you have explicitly mu and the whole thing should be mu independent. And that equation implicitly defines the mu dependence of your running coupling. And by the way, um, in the MS bar scheme, um, we know more about this delta G. So it is always a power series in the renormalized coupling, but in the MS bar scheme, it is also strictly um, power series times one over epsilon coefficients. And that in particular means that here there is no explicit mu dependence. Mu enters only via G of mu, but it doesn't enter explicitly. No explicit mu dependence. And that is in other schemes, it is different. For example, you have, we have seen explicit results from loop diagrams which contain logarithm of mu. Okay, and so in general, some loop results like renormalization constants, they could contain logarithm of mu explicitly, but not in the MS bar scheme. The renormalization constants in the MS bar scheme by construction are not explicitly mu dependent, but they are mu dependent via the dependence on the renormalized couplings. And so that would change in other schemes. But anyway, uh, this defines now implicitly a function G of mu. Let us go on and do the same for the mass. So let us define D by D mu should be zero of this very bare mass square, which is of course the same as the normal bare mass square, uh, so let's maybe not work it out. So you can do some similar analysis here. And uh, so that defines a G of mu, this defines an M square of mu, and the third bare quantity is the field operator. So there is no parameter associated with the field, but we can study the normalization of the field, which is now somehow mu dependent. And so the overall normalization of the renormalized field depends on the square root of z and on this additional mu square factor. And so let us define the following. <coughs> so and define the following object. Let's call it square root of small set of mu. So this is a small set, the other one is a capital set. And uh, let's define it such as the combination of this prefactor. This is now mu to the minus epsilon times square root of the capital set. And the capital set is of course again a power series in the coupling because capital set is calculated at one loop, two loop order. And again in the MS bar scheme, so it depends on powers of G of mu, and it does not contain explicitly ln mu. Oh, but 
in the MS bar scheme, it is just a function of g of mu. Okay, and then we define a mu dependent function, square root z of mu, in this way. And it has an explicit mu dependence and an implicit mu dependence via the running coupling. And this is a mu dependent normalization factor for the field operator. Okay, then, well, okay, so not so much time, but I think that is maybe just enough. So just as a picture, G bear and G of mu. So let's look at a diagram. And typically, we plot it as a function of the logarithm of mu, since, as you already know, ln mu is the one, the combination which typically appears. So it is natural to plot things as a function of ln mu. Let's plot the coupling constant g of mu as a function of ln mu for constant gb. So we get some trajectory, so maybe in some color. So we would get some trajectory. So that means gb is equal to some constant. Let's call it constant one. But if you, so all points on this trajectory have the same uh, very bare coupling, but there would be another trajectory where gb is different, is a different constant. But again, all points on the green tra tra trajectory uh, again have the same uh, value of the bare coupling constant and so it goes on. So you get many trajectories and on each tra trajectory the very bare coupling is constant. That means on each trajectory the physics is unchanged. So you can change mu and simultaneously change the coupling in this way and then the physics will remain the same. So a long these trajectories, physics is unchanged. So you can say that the physics, uh, physical outcome of your theory really does not depend only on the numerical value of coupling constants, but more generally speaking, it depends on which trajectory you are in this diagram. But uh, where on the trajectory uh, doesn't matter. It's your choice. Okay. And so this uh, visually shows that the parameter mu has no physical influence. It doesn't matter how you choose it. You can choose it any way you like and always obtain the same physical answers. Now, Okay, we have enough time, I think, to define the very famous beta and gamma functions, which describe the running couplings. So the beta function is simply the function which determines how the coupling runs. It is defined as the derivative of these trajectories. So let's define it. And uh, there are slightly different conventions, but I will use here one which is, I think, very well known or very familiar, namely a dimensionless derivative with respect to mu. So mu d by d mu of uh, g of mu, which is the same um, as the derivative g of mu with respect to ln mu. Okay, and this is the way we will mainly use it. So we always use derivatives with respect to ln mu, which is the same as mu d by d mu. So it's a dimensionless uh, derivative, which is natural because always ln mu appears everywhere. So this defines the beta function. It is the slope of the curve. And similarly, we can define what is called gamma function or anomalous dimension for the mass. Gamma m square is exactly the same, um, but for the mass, namely um, dimensionless one over m square of mu times d of m square of mu divided by ln mu. 
uh, which is equivalent to saying derivative of ln m square divided by ln nu. That is gamma function. And there is also a gamma function or a so-called anomalous dimension for the field normalization for this square root of small z. And here we define it like the following, namely derivative of ln square root of small z of mu derivative with respect to ln mu. These are three simple definitions which uh, give you the slope of these trajectories and if you walk along the trajectories defined by these slopes, then the physics is unchanged. So, um, the next step would be to calculate the beta functions and uh, you know, how can we calculate the beta functions? The functions are defined indirectly or via a so-called implicit function definition, but nevertheless, it's easy to solve this definition that that derivative should be zero. Solve it for the beta function, so let's just uh, do that briefly, and then we can stop. So this is defined as an implicit function. So we can rearrange. So if we rearrange, for example, the first equation, then first of all, we can take the derivative with respect to ln mu. This then also vanishes. And uh, so the derivative with respect to ln mu of gb, which is a function of g of mu and of mu explicit, um, that should be zero. Uh, so how can we work it out? We, uh, of course, have two derivatives. Once we have a partial derivative, partial derivative with respect to ln mu of gb, where we take the derivative of this explicit mu dependence with respect to mu, plus the partial derivative with respect to the coupling, bare coupling derivative with respect to the renormalized coupling, that is this derivative, times the inner derivative coupling derivative with respect to ln mu, which is the beta function. So, and then we see zero is equal to the sum of these two terms and we can solve for the beta function. And then we have an explicit formula for beta, namely beta is given by minus the ratio of the two partial derivatives minus uh, bare coupling derivative with respect to the coupling G divided by bare coupling derivative with respect to ln mu. So, and then once you work out these two derivatives, you can calculate the beta function. And of course, you can do it similarly for these gammas and uh, then you have a calculational recipe for the beta function. All right, and here we can stop. This provides uh, your first intuition on the renormalization group. Uh, you see that the renormalization group allows to understand the mu dependence of quantities in general of physical results or of green functions or here of running couplings in more detail. And uh, please, until Wednesday, look at the first two exercises on the sheet. I think the very first uh, part 1A is on doing exactly the same for QED. And the second, I forgot, what is the second? Uh, determine the beta and gamma functions at the one loop level, okay? Uh, using exactly this formula. So that we can discuss on Wednesday and then we can go on. Yep. Shouldn't the factors in the formula for beta be the other way around? Ah, I think you are right. Ln mu and g. Sorry about that. Yes, of course. That's true. Very good. Yes. All right, then see you on Wednesday.